sets himself up as the authority in life, the number one teacher. Do you know what? The ruler of the universe. And when Jesus says, I say unto you, it has ramifications for all of our lives because you know what? If Jesus is the sole authority on earth, he's not like Muhammad. He's not like Confucius. He's not like any other religious teacher. He's not Mahatma Gandhi. Listen, he is Jesus and he said, I am the way, the truth and the life. I am the authority. Do you know what? Everybody in this room, no matter where you are at in faith, we all got to wrestle with the words of Jesus Christ. He wasn't just, you know, it's not just the words of a godly man. It's the words of the God man. He sits as God in flesh teaching. It's going to be awesome. We've been talking the last uh, few weeks about how we can gear up and get ready for our fall series. And so, yes, man, get your book uh, across the different campuses. There's only, I think, 200 left. And so uh, we've got some in the lobby. Grab those after the service and mark your calendar. I think you really appreciate Andrew McCourt. You just uh, love, love him as he shares on the 11th and 12th. So, so good to have you here today. If you have your Bibles with you, would you turn with me to 1 John chapter 4? That's where we're going to be hanging out here today. And if something to maybe write down a few notes with, uh, 1 John chapter 4. Uh, in case you're here for the first time or with some summer travels, we've talked a bit about the background on 1 John. It was written by John. This is also the same uh, dude who wrote uh, Revelation as well as the Gospel of John. Uh, he was a cousin to Jesus. He was a fisherman. He was one of the inner three. Now, as we study 1 John, it's not going to specifically say that John is the author of 1 John, but we know that because of the similarities between the writing style of 1 John as well as the Gospel of John. Uh, they both use simple Greek. They use contrasting images like light and darkness. Uh, John speaks of being an eyewitness to the events of Jesus. And so we, we know that John was very possibly the youngest of the disciples when they were called. He was probably in his late teens or early 20s when he was called to follow Jesus. And so he heard his teachings and he witnessed his miracles. We're, we're now about, what, 50, 60 years after that point. It's around AD 85 to 90, somewhere in that range. John's about 80 years old. He's writing, he's referring to people as dear children, just with a fatherly heart. Uh, he's also nicknamed by Jesus as a son of thunder because he can kind of tell it like it is. And at different points, we see that in 1 John. He's calling people liars and children of the devil and antichrist and all that. So he just says it like it is. And today, we are in chapter 4. So let's start by reading chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. It is 1 through 6. Dear friends, would everybody say, dear friends? Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. You might want to underline that part in your Bible right there. Test the spirits to see if they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you recognize the spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the who? Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Another great verse to underline in your Bible or highlight on your iPhone if you're following that way. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. They are from the world, and speaking of false teachers and false prophets, they are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world. And the world does what? The world listens to them. We are from God. And whoever knows God listens to us. 
but whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth from the spirit of falsehood. Let me tell you one of the, one of the tremendous moments of my life going back 10, 15 years ago. There was a guy, I was youth pastor, then associate pastor at a church in, in Everett. And there was a family that came to the church there and he oversaw that region of Jiffy Loops. He's actually since become the CEO of Jiffy Loop. But at that point in time, he was attending the church. I was the youth pastor for his kid and he oversaw a region of Jiffy Loops. He came up to me one day and said, Jeff, do you want to go undercover to a Jiffy Loop? And I said, 100% yes. This is like the fulfillment of a dream. This is mission impossible. This is all that, all that stuff going on. You want to go undercover? He says, I'm going to, I'm going to give you a pin. That's actually a video recorder. It will record the entire experience. And then I will use this as a training exercise for Jiffy Lube employees. I was so fired up. I was just stoked about it. So he got me all ready to go and I'm walking into the Jiffy Lube and he said, you gotta gotta kind of bend down a little bit so the camera, so I'm kind of bending down like this. Uh, Hello, I'd like an oil change, please, you know? And and so we walked this whole process and I felt so cool. I felt so empowered, right? Because they had no idea that I'm recording this entire thing. and then it gets done and he pulls the video off and, and it was great. Now he, he, would, he would later come to me and tell me that he actually couldn't do that anymore because some of the you know, uppity ups that Jiffy Loop says that actually might be illegal so you can't do that anymore. So my dream of being undercover kind of died, died then. But it was a great experience while it lasted. Why did he want me to do that? Because he wanted his employees to be alert and to be in a constant state of readiness. And I think that's really the heart of John here in in chapter four. He wants these believers to be alert. He wants them to be in a constant state of readiness. And so he says, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see if whether they are from God. Now we know that there is the Holy Spirit of God. The moment that we give our life to Jesus, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit lives within us and the Holy Spirit will equip us and will empower us, will comfort us. I I think about a time when I was in college going through a very difficult time and I remember I was so overwhelmed. I was so confused. It was just a very difficult time. I remember walking into a little chapel at Northwest University and just so overwhelmed, but the Holy Spirit of God met me in such a powerful way in that little chapel, gave me a sense of peace and assurance, letting me know that the decisions I'm making are right. And and it, and it was a transformative experience in my life. I walked in confused and overwhelmed. I walked out just assured that the Lord is with me. He will help me. He will guide me. And I'm on the right path for that he had for my life. So many times I think about his comfort. I can think about being in, in different worship services and there was a strong presence of the Holy Spirit there. So the Holy Spirit is a gift to us. But what we read here in verse one is that there are also other spirits, John says. Now, what he's speaking of here, the other spirit that he's speaking about are the false teachers and the false prophets. So when, when, you, when you research this, that, that appears to be what's going on here. Is he saying these, these false spirits, these are the false prophets who are leading people astray. What possibly was going on was the people of God were so excited to hear from God that they were just believing anything. Even what these false prophets were saying. And so what does he say right there? He says, I want you to, to test Test the spirits to see if where, whether they are from God. And that word test, when you look at the original language of that word, it it speaks to, to prove or examine is what it means. And it talks about really how you would prove or just check the, the genuineness or the authenticity of a coin to see if it's real. He says, examine and test, be, be sure it's real. 
be in a state of, of readiness, be alert. And, and this wasn't just something hypothetical for John. If you look there, he says in verse, the, the second part of verse one there, he says, notice, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. He's like, yo, this is already happening. Like many false prophets, many false teachings are out there and you need to be aware. I think that was obviously good wisdom for these believers then. And I believe with all my heart that that is good wisdom for us today. We talked about the different purposes for the book of 1 John to, to emphasize the joy of our salvation. And to, one of the purposes of 1 John was for people not to be led astray. And this is, this is real for us today. What, what are some of the false teachings that are just out there today? You might want to write these down. This is not an exhaustive list, but this is just some of them. There's universalism, which teaches really that, that everybody will eventually be saved and that all roads lead to heaven. That is not biblical at all. So universalism would be a false teaching. There, there's religious pluralism, which teaches that, that all ideas are equally valid and equally true, not biblical at all. There's new ageism. One of the most prominent today is, is progressive Christianity. We talked about this in one of our theology talks. It, progressive Christianity might be one of the most dangerous false teachings out there today because it really teaches, well, you can have Jesus on your own terms. And so it's really caused many people to, to tragically probably think that they're Christians when they're not. So you get, you got progressive Christianity, you got the prosperity gospel. That's about people just kind of just preaching in order to get rich. And so there are false teachings that are out there. And if we're not careful, if we're not alert, if we're not dialed into what the word of God says, we will be led astray. And that's why he's saying, I want you to be ready. Man, be prepared. And so what he's now gonna do here as he continues on is he's gonna make it really simple. He says, verse two, this is how you can recognize the spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist. He'll then go on further on into verse five. They are from the world and speak from the viewpoint of the world and the world listens to them. And so if we wanted to just break this down in our mind, we, we know that, that true teachers, right, acknowledge Jesus right, and are not speaking from the viewpoint of the world, but false teachers do not acknowledge Jesus and are speaking from the viewpoint of the world. And so he, he says, man, the, the, these are an, the Antichrist. Now, th he is not speaking of the actual Antichrist who the Bible says will be during end times of the tribulation. He is saying that they have the spirit of the Antichrist, so to speak, in that they are leading people astray. And he's gonna use that term a, a number of times. And then he says, not only that, but, but they speak from the viewpoint of the world. And what I think is so significant, and again, something else to maybe underline in your Bible, is where it says they speak from the viewpoint of the world and the world listens to them. Meaning you, you will see people and they'll throw things out there that are completely unbiblical and people will rally to that. Yes, amazing, awesome, because their home is the world. It's all about a worldly viewpoint. So they're, they're gonna throw things out, people are gonna rally to that cause, and yet it is absolutely false and it is absolutely leading people astray. So he says you need to be alert, you need to be ready, but then he gives this incredible encouragement in verse four when he says, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Man, what, what, what a beautiful promise. I want you to imagine with me for a moment that, that you, you were required for some reason to, to go with this group of people and they took you to this one or two acre parcel of property. And they dropped you in the middle of this parcel of property that was, that was a, just a, a forest of trees. Big, 
mammoth trees for an acre or two. And they told you, and for some reason you had to oblige, you, you can't leave this acre or two until you cut down every one of these trees. Every one of these trees you've got to cut down. And then they hand you a butter knife. <laughs> Say, th this is what you have. This is the tool you've been given. This is your resource to cut down these two acres of mammoth trees and you can't leave until you're done. Good luck. Put, put yourself there. How would you feel? Like, well, would that not just feel overwhelming? Would that not feel just impossible and, and defeating? But then imagine with me that it's about five, 10 minutes later and a couple trucks pull up and they have these incredible industrial chainsaws. And they say, actually, now, now we're actually gonna give you these chainsaws. You can use these chainsaws and here's 10 chainsaws, sharpened, just incredible. How would that change your perspective on that task? Be huge. It go from something impossible and feeling defeated to being energized, feeling like you, you can do it, you can accomplish it. Hey, here's the beauty of what the Bible teaches us is each and every one of us have the Holy Spirit of God. Obviously the Holy Spirit is not a tool, but he equips us and empowers us to do that which would be impossible on our own. So John is saying that it wasn't that these believers were smarter than these false teachers. It's that they are indwelt by the one who is. They have the Holy Spirit of God. The moment we give our life to Jesus, the moment we become a child of God, we have the Holy Spirit of God in us. And he will equip us and he will empower us and he will guide us. He will sustain us in, in difficult times. And guys, he will give us those checks in our spirit. Well, when something just seems a bit off, we'll sense a check. And so we don't have to do this thing on our own. We are empowered and equipped by the one who is greater, by the, the living God is with us to give us success. Let's look at verses seven through 21 and read a fairly lengthy passage of scripture. Uh, it says, dear friends, let us love one another for love comes from God. Again, if you have your Bibles with you and you are into like using your Bible as a life textbook and mark it up, you might want to underline every time we see the word love. So as we read 7 through 21, just underline or highlight on your phones every time we see the word love. Dear friends, let us love one another for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is... This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit and we have seen and testified that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on his love, the love that God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. Therefore, there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. I wonder what the theme of these verses is right here. <laughs> have you ever heard of that game Wordle before? Raise your hand if you've heard of the game Wordle. That, that online game that was popular a while back. Uh, Carrie, my wife, she is amazing. There, there, there was this Wordle online game where 
where you basically you had to guess the word of the day. And so you would just, you know, put in a word there and then they would put a online, a green square if it was the right letter in the right place and a yellow square if it was the right letter for the word, but it wasn't in the right place. And you had like five or six attempts to try to find out the word of the day. If you played Wordle, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And, and I don't, I was not good at Wordle. My mind just doesn't work that way. Carrie's does. I don't know that she ever missed one. She's just super good at that. And so when I was walking around looking for some birthday presents for her, uh, I, I saw the Wordle board game. So one of the presents that I got Carrie for her birthday was the Wordle board game. And on her birthday, we played it together. And, and how it basically went down was, was one person got to choose a word and then everybody else tried to guess it. And then the, the person that guessed the word would then go around and put a green square where the letter was in the right spot and a yellow square where it wasn't in the right spot. And then they had to kind of guess the word. And, and, and I actually kind of missed a few of the squares up for Kylie's. And so I kind of, kind of had to apologize to her. But when it was Kylie's chance to choose a word, what word did she choose? She chose the word agape. Agape. Now, there are different types of words for love in the Bible that we're speaking of right here. And one of those is agape. So there's different types of love. There is, there's, there is uh, phileo, there's, which is like a brotherly love. There, there's eros, which is like a, 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 a marriage type of love. And then the highest and most Christian form of love is agape. Now, here's the key thing. Every time that John uses the word love in 1 John, he uses the word agape. It's the highest and most distinct distinct form of love. It's a decision that we make. It's a type of love displayed by Jesus on the cross. In fact, I think somewhere around 20 times in these 15 verses, he will use the word agape love. And so we, we, we read throughout the narrative of scripture that, that we are called to love one another. In fact, I think a, a beautiful example of this, you, you can just maybe write this down and, and read it later on. First Thessalonians chapter four, verses nine through 10 it says, now about your love for one another, we do not need to write to you for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia, yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more. I think that's so powerful that Paul is writing to the church at Thessalonica. And he says, here's the deal. Here's one thing that I don't even need to to write you about. You, You just have this nailed down. You love one another really well. Why? Because you've been taught by God. You've been, you've been taught by God. God. God has put this love for others in your heart. And really, this, this is really the beauty of the body of Christ. Is that as we gather together, we're able to, to love one another and pray for one another and encourage one another. Because isn't it true that, that life isn't always perfect, right? Each and every one of us will go through difficult days and, and just hardships in life. I'll tell you what, there, there are people in our church family right now that are going through unimaginable challenges. Your heart just breaks as you pray with them and, and stand with them and uh, incredible. And what we know the Bible teaches is that, that just because we're a Christian, doesn't mean we are going to be sheltered from all the problems and pains of life. Have, have you noticed that? Just because you follow Jesus doesn't mean that life is perfect. We, we walk through those difficult times. Yet what the Bible does promise is that we don't have to walk through those seasons of life alone or in our own strength. Because the Holy Spirit of God is within us And he will comfort us and he will encourage us and he will help us. 
And then there are many times as well that, that he will use the people of God. He will use our, our brothers and sisters in Christ to come alongside and, and love one another. And, and on our best days, man, we're living that well as a church family. And, and so many of you just exemplify this. Man, your heart to come alongside people, your heart to serve others, your heart to be a blessing. It, it's incredible to watch as it, just you live out this command of loving one another because God just has, has given you this love for the people of God in such a significant way. And what, he, what he's now gonna do here is really in verses, uh, th this chunk really from 13 on, or really in this entire passage right here, he's gonna give this beautiful description of love. And you might wanna write these things down uh, as well. He says, he says this, he says love is visible. We'll see that, that, that God's love is visible and sent in Jesus. He's gonna say that, that love is an act of a will, this agape love. It's not that we always feel like doing it, but, but really we've been taught by God and God inspires us to live that way. Number three, love is sacrificial. We'll see that in these verses here. Number four, love serves the unlovable, right? That, that, that we love others that, that might not love in return. And then number five, love addresses sin. And so he'll, he'll speak about the type of love that we're to have for others. Now notice what he says there in verses 11 through 12, where he says, no one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. What, what, what has been said about, about that verse is it's possible some of the false teachers were claiming to have seen God or had visions of God and that kind of gave them this authority. But John says, no, no one has seen God. But then he says what? He says, as we love others, God's love is really seen in us and in that. And all of a sudden, man, that raises the urgency of love super high, doesn't it? Because what the Bible seems to say that is, is, is how we love one another, how we love the body of Christ is a witness to the world. That as, as they see us living out in agape, sacrificial type of love for others, man, people are going to see that. That's going to stand out in our culture today. So all of a sudden we begin to pray, God, would you just give me a heart of just sacrificial agape love for the people of God? May I be a witness to you in how I love others. And then what he does is he's going to, later on there in verse 17 or whatever it is, he's going to say, man, this is how we have confidence on the day of judgment. What he does there is, is he points people to the judgment seat of Christ. And so he says, man, just, just fast forward your life, be beyond the here and now, but focus to the end. And that the, the, the judgment seat of Christ, it's, it's spoken of after, after the rapture, part of end times events. Every one of us will stand before the judgment seat of Christ, the Bible talks about. It's called the Bema seat. And it was a, a raised platform in biblical times where these runners would receive their, their really their, their, their victory crowns. And so the, the judgment seat of Christ is not a place of guilt or condemnation. We've been forgiven. It's a time of bestowing rewards for all that we've done for the kingdom of God. And what the Bible teaches is that everything that's of, of earthly or temporary value is gone and all that remains is that which we've invested in the kingdom of God. So that's what he's saying. Man, th this is how we can be confident at the judgment seat of Christ is if we are a person of love. And so he inspires us and challenges us to, to live with a, an agape type of love for others. I don't know if you're familiar with these things called TED Talks, but they're these talks that are out there and, and uh, there, there's just a countless number of TED Talks that are out there. But, but one of them is called Lollipop Leadership. And what this TED Talk does is, is a guy named Drew Dudley, and he talks about how he was on this campus one day, and it was this college campus, and yet yeah, he was going around helping welcome the incoming students. And what he was doing was he was going around with a bunch of lollipops, just handing out lollipops to all the kids at this 
college campus on their first day. And he walked up to one of the, 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 the new student kind of check-in areas and there was this, this gal and this guy in line and, and, and he walked up to this guy behind this gal and said, here, would you give this gal a lollipop? And he's like, oh, okay. So he grabs a lollipop, hands it to the gal. Then Drew Dudley says to this gal's parents, his incoming freshman's parents, see one day away from home and she's already taking candy from strangers. And he makes kind of a joke about it. They're right there. Well, fast forward, he says. Fast forward a couple years later. He's getting ready to graduate, the guy that handed out the lollipops. And a gal walks up to him, and it's that gal. And she says, I just want to thank you for, for handing me that lollipop. He's like, what? He says, what you don't, she says, what you don't know is, is as I stood there in that line, I was thinking, I, I'm not going to stay here. I'm going to leave. This isn't a fit for me. Yet that moment, when you have that guy behind me in line, hand me a lollipop, it was transformative. It changed my entire perspective. It broke the ice and I decided to stay at the college campus because of that moment. And just so you know, I'm now engaged to that guy. <laughs> and we're getting married. Here, here's what Drew Dudley said that was so impactful. He says, I, for the life of me, he says, I cannot remember that moment. He says, I have no recollection of that moment at all. He says, I have searched the recesses of my mind. I have worked so hard to remember that moment, but for the life of me, I just can't do it. And, and here's the point that he made. He said, how, how crazy is it that what will go down in this couple's life as one of the most impactful, significant moments of their life, I don't even remember. And his whole point is, is you are more influential than you think. You are making more of an impact than you think. Because who knows what moments as you step out and lead and serve, you may not even remember it, but it's been impact for the lives of others. And I think that that's just a beautiful illustration or challenge or way to inspire us in this is that as we seek to be a person of agape love, as we seek to make this our mission, our life will make an impact, our life will make a difference, the kingdom of God will be advanced, seeds of faith will be planted, and even though we not, might not remember those moments, or know those moments, they will have an ongoing impact for the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? And just say, Lord, what are you speaking to my heart about? Maybe you're here today and you're here today in person or online and you feel like, you know, I'm, I'm in the middle of a forest and I feel like I've got a butter knife. I feel overwhelmed right now, but I just need the Holy Spirit of God to, to remind me that he is with me and I don't have to get through this alone. Can I just, if you're in that place, can I encourage you? I love Deuteronomy 31, 8. It says, the Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Lord, we do thank you so much for the truth of your word. Lord, I pray for, for all of my friends who just feel overwhelmed. 
Lord, I pray that even right now, they would just sense your comforting presence in their life. I pray that they'd be reminded that they don't have to battle the season alone. They don't have to tackle this alone. You are with them. You are for them. And even above and beyond that, you, you, you've made them a part of this body. And so I pray that you would help us to, to come alongside. To be reminded that we don't got to walk through these seasons alone because you promised to strengthen us and help us. Lord, there's a lot that's out there. And I pray that you'd help us to be alert to live in a state of readiness because we want your best for our life. We know, God, that your way is the best way. Your word is truth. You have beautiful plans and purposes for every person here. And I pray that, that we would stand on your word and on your truth. And even in a world that's seeking to, to, to get people off the path of your best, I pray that we would be alert to test things so that we can experience your best promises for our life and our family and our legacy. Lord, I thank you for this incredible church. I thank you for the incredible people. I thank you for how they, they live this out so well, loving and serving and come along. I thank you. I pray that they'd be encouraged today because so many people beautifully exemplify what we're talking about and we honor them and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen, amen.